Good morning. morning. Welcome to Worship at Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Landon Martin. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to uh, welcome you to God's house as we uh, begin another week with the Lord's name and with his blessing. I'm privileged to be leading in worship today alongside our vicar, Fabricio Farron, one of our elders, and uh, Becky on the organ, and of course, the Grace Lutheran Choir that you can't see this, but is uh, really filling up the uh, balcony up there, led by our music director, Hillary. And so uh, I'm thankful for all of you. Now, if you have any questions about anything you see or hear today at uh, Grace Lutheran, uh, any one of us in white would uh, love to have a conversation about the mission and ministry, the congregation, what Jesus can mean in your life, and so on and so forth. And so uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, First of all, I want to just simply mention that uh, we like to keep track of you, make sure that we're meeting your needs, that uh, resources are available in a number of ways. So if you're here in person, that means uh, finding the blue cards in front of you and uh, giving us a little bit of information, uh, in particular uh, name and how many people will be taking communion today. Um, And if you've never been here before and you're comfortable with it, a a phone number or email would be uh, helpful and and, uh, I can reach out to you uh, throughout the week. Uh, In addition to that, there is a space at the bottom and, of course, the back side of the card if you have specific needs or prayer concerns and you'd like to send those my way as well. Uh, That's kind of your hotline to me, so be aware of that. If you're joining us online uh, from home or elsewhere this morning, uh, you can add your name in the comments of the live stream video. Uh, Then we'll know you're here with us. And if you have uh, prayer requests or needs, uh, of course, you can add those in there or or through the private messenger uh, option. Uh, A couple of uh, quick announcements. First of all, uh, I'll just call your attention again to this is the second week we've been using a new service setting template, and so uh, if you're familiar with some of the responses, it's just a little bit different um, as we cycle through those throughout the church here. Uh, Part of that is uh, the Kyrie that follows the uh, absolution. Uh, Today that's going to be sung entirely by our choir, so uh, the words are there for you to follow along. Uh, but uh, they're going to take care of that one for us. Um, A couple of kind of housekeeping things. September 5th, Labor Day weekend, begins uh, a new service time for the early service. So if you were to venture back and get an earlier start to your day, uh, that's going to begin at 8.30 starting September 5th, so in two Sundays. Um, In addition to that, not this week, but next week, our public church office hours are going to shift to Tuesday to Friday, 10 to 3. Uh, Still available on Mondays via email, phone, so on and so forth, but uh, just be aware that there's some some more uh, church office hours available uh, publicly and in person. And uh, also, and especially, uh, today is New Member Sunday. And in your uh, bulletin insert, you can see a list of the two or 12 new members joining the Grace family uh, today. Now, I was really surprised at this. It, uh, we offer the new member right at the early service and the late service, and most of them were at the early service, so I'm sorry. You'll have to somewhere else shake their hands, meet them. I promise they're all wonderful people, and we are uh, abundantly blessed that God is, is growing the kingdom in this place. And uh, the ones that are here with us today, um, I really encourage you to uh, get to know them, shake their hand. Uh, just absolutely uh, a blessing that, that God has given by, you know, continuing to send and extend the kingdom here. Um, today, our, uh, our theme for worship is really an important one. Uh, we go to uh, really a, kind of a fierce debate between Jesus and some of his opponents, the Pharisees, the scribes. And what we learn is how, we ca- how important it is to get church traditions right, in that uh, they're certainly not equal to Scripture. They have their place, but uh, as soon as they become kind of a, a legalistic thing to follow them or not, uh, then they can be troublesome and push people even away from God. And so Jesus scolds the church leaders for doing exactly that and claiming to add into Scripture this morning. And we'll talk about what that means in our own lives as we walk with the Lord in our Christian life, as we interact in our families and our churches and so forth. And ultimately what we're going to see is uh, a God that loves us and serves us throughout every effort and fiber of his being. And so uh, that message of hope and comfort is, is central in our service today. Now with that said, I invite you to uh, kick off the service with me by standing and singing our hymn of invocation.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Be loved in the Lord. Let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Please kneel or be seated for a time of confession. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your eternal life. For I am hardly sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray that God has mercy. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and, and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error, that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah 29. The vision of all this has come become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because these people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed saying of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the, one, in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter five. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself a savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, <clears throat> just as Christ does, and holds fast to his wife and the two because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void of the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message comes to us from Mark chapter 7. I'd like to highlight the following words to launch us into our text. And the Pharisees came to Jesus. So far the text. I need you to imagine with me this morning that it is... Easter Sunday, and the alarm clock just made itself known. So, now at this point, we have to take kind of the fork in the road and look at both options, because some of you are probably sunrise Easter service people, and some of you are late service Easter people, and there's a difference. So, if you are a sunrise Easter service person, when that alarm clock makes itself known, it's dark outside. When you get up, you're probably going to have some coffee, but probably not breakfast, not till after church. And 
very likely if you're headed to church, especially with some members of your family, you're going to have to wake them up, maybe multiple times wake them up to make sure that they're going to be ready to go in time. Now, if you are a late service Easter Sunday person, you probably have time to eat breakfast. You probably don't just have the cup of coffee, you have some eggs or maybe pancakes, something nice for Easter Sunday, something of that type. It's light out when you wake up. The family, maybe you only have to wake them up once to get them ready for church, something like that. But whichever road you travel down, those roads converge. When you're in the car, you're headed for church, and there are certain expectations that you have that you know you can bank on. You know you're going to walk in and there's going to be white and gold everywhere. You know the, the smell of pollen from the Easter lilies is going to be as strong as it ever is throughout the year in this place. But you almost in your car can kind of start humming because you know exactly when the organ starts and it's going to play. That's the one. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Jesus Christ is risen today, Alleluia, is the opening song for Easter. And why is it the opening song for Easter? Because it always has been the opening song for Easter. You can count on it. And if it doesn't happen, if I got really bold, if maybe Hillary, our music director, and I kind of schemed through Lent to do something different and mix it up, it wouldn't feel, wow, some of you already, I'm, relax, I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> if it was to change, something would feel off. It, it might even, depending on you and your tradition and your expectations, it might feel like Easter wasn't quite all the Easter that it could have been. You might tell me in the handshake line that I made your Easter not very good. And you know what? <laughs> I would probably agree with you. You see, at our core, we love our traditions. So I eat almost the same breakfast every single morning no matter what. I go to the same gas station all the time almost no matter what. We like to do things a certain way. It makes us comfortable. And church is by no means an exception. We expect to walk in the door and shake hands with a greeter who's in a great mood. We expect to be handed a bulletin by someone wearing a suit. We expect to sit in the same spot, hear from a preacher who's maybe 65 with white hair standing still. We expect certain things in church. That includes candles, colors, songs, just about everything in this place is on a rhythm of tradition. And you know what? I kind of like the traditions a lot actually. There's some marvelous things about our church traditions and how we teach the faith and pass it on through all kinds of different symbolisms and experiences. And if we jump into our gospel lesson today, Jesus is teaching an incredibly important lesson about when traditions inside the church start to hurt the church instead of help the church. And that's a very powerful, important message. So let's dive in. First of all, we need to know Jesus is about 90, 100 miles north of Jerusalem uh, when this text picks up. So that's a pretty significant distance for travel, especially when you're uh, at the time of uh, no motorized vehicles. Most people would walk from where they had to go. And the first people mentioned in verse 1 are the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees of this local community uh, would have been the people designated by the organized church to uphold the law in this community. And so it was their job to walk around and have kind of a keen observation to people doing the right thing or the wrong thing. They were the ones that would prescribe what needed to be done, what kind of sacrifices if people uh, did the wrong things. And so they really held the gauge on everyone's relationship with God. And you know what? Their authority was unquestioned. They never had to debate with anyone. They were the experts. They held the keys. God and them, there was a Pharisee in between, and that was the system. But the scribes, 
In verse 1, it also tells us the scribes came from Jerusalem. Now, if they're coming 90 miles on foot, this is planned. This is one of those rare, unheard of situations where the local Pharisees felt threatened. They felt like their authority was being questioned, and they needed some help. And now the scribes, they were considered kind of the cream of the crop, the top Pharisees. These were the ones that were best trained in the law. These were the ones that interpreted the law. These were the ones trained in rhetoric and debate so that if anything came up, they could always uphold the teachings of the Pharisees and the law as they saw it, no matter what. But the thing about the scribes, they almost never left Jerusalem because no one questioned the Pharisees. They didn't need the scribes. So the scribes studied in Jerusalem, and that was their existence. So when verse 1 tells us the scribes walked 90 miles to interact with Jesus, that is a big deal. This is a powerful statement that the establishment church fears Jesus and wants to get rid of Jesus. And so they call in the experts, the like Navy SEALs of the Sanhedrin, if you will. They always get their man, and they know the scribes are going to win. So what do the scribes do? The scribes make an accusation against the disciples, first of all. And the accusation they make is they claim the disciples don't wash their hands before they eat and often have not been washing their hands before they eat. Now, if we look at actually the Torah, the law of Moses, there are some laws about hand washing, two of them. One of them is when priests would enter the temple for official priestly duties. They would wash their hands as kind of a ceremonial cleansing of going from the outside world into the presence of God. The other law for the washing of hands was the people were supposed to wash their hands when they had any kind of contact with uh, a bodily fluid for, for cleanliness. What the religious leaders of the day did with this was what they did with all the laws. They exaggerated it. And so all of a sudden, not only are you washing your hands in these two situations, but they threw in all the meal times and at specific times of day and specific times of year and with specific duties. And then it wasn't enough to wash your hands. You had to wash the vessels you touch before you eat and when you prepare the food. And then you had to wash the table and the chairs and all these different things in a ceremonial way. And it was taught as if it was scripture from God himself that this must be done. Now, the Pharisees, the established church through the ages, did this with almost every law. They would take a law, and they believed that they needed to put a fence around the law to protect the people. If the people were going to follow the law perfectly, they needed to believe that the law was far stricter than it really was, so that if they messed up a little bit, they're still okay. So in every circumstance, for example, if I were to just make something up, like if the law were to say, no running, thou shalt not run, something like that, the Pharisees would tell you, thou shalt not walk fast, thou shalt not jog. And so you would think you had to do so much more than you really did. And the Pharisees taught this absolutely as if it was Scripture, and the people couldn't access Scripture. They had no way to refute what the Pharisees said, and so that just sort of was the way. The people knew it was happening, but they had no idea what was what, and so they had no option other than to follow the instructions of the Pharisees. There's an interesting thing in this text that when the scribes accuse the disciples of not washing their hands, the word for washing they use is the Greek word that's the source for baptism. They use baptizo. And so they're talking about a ceremonial cleansing to make something 
righteous and right before God and, and able to be used for God's service, not just uh, a cleanliness to keep something looking nice or safer and, and so on and so forth. And so here's the attack that they make against Jesus. They say, your disciples don't follow the law, and so they are unfit for service to God. And if all of your followers are unfit for service to God, you, sir, are unfit for service to God. It's an accusation by extension. And it's a pretty smart one. And it's very public. And these people have never been wrong before. But then, all of a sudden, Jesus speaks. Jesus tells them. He makes an accusation against them, calling them hypocrites. To their face, he calls them hypocrites. The most unquestioned leadership functioning people in the community. He calls them hypocrites and accuses them of ignoring, rejecting God's commandments in order to establish their own traditions. And the word here for establish is to guard and protect. And so the accusation is, the important thing to you, Jesus is saying to the scribes, is not what God has said. It's that you get to interpret it and deliver it on your terms. You are what's important, not God. That's what Jesus says back. Let's reflect on the scribes for a minute. They're the villain in the story. But I think if we're honest, there are some moments where we're a little bit like the scribes. So, if you've ever walked into church and someone was in your seat or seen the acolyte miss a candle or thought the wrong color was on the altar or the pastor said the wrong part and you couldn't get past it and you thought some unchristian things, in that moment, you're a scribe. If you've ever known about a tradition you didn't like in the church, but you knew it was important to someone else, and you fought it just to prove a point, on that side of the coin, you're a scribe there too. See, like I said, I love the traditions of our church, and I think traditions are important and beautiful and wonderful, but the message that Jesus is delivering to us today is the traditions have to serve God. And the scribes were using the traditions to push people away from God and to alienate people from God. And when we do these kinds of things in God's house, when we think someone's wearing the wrong thing, singing off key, sitting in the wrong place, and we use that to shame them, if you will, we push them away from God. And the traditions don't serve him anymore. Now, this text today is a fascinating one because we have to remember no one had ever seen anyone question the Pharisees, let alone the scribes, ever before. And so you've got to be reading this and wondering, what's next? So the scribes make an incredible attack against the disciples and Jesus by extension. Jesus comes back with a brilliant, perfect, absolutely correct response. What do the scribes have to say now? Nothing. Nothing. 
Someone at 8 o'clock said it reminded them of maybe the first mic drop statement in history, and it really was. When Jesus spoke, they had nothing to say because they never for one second believed that Jesus could ever do anything except, except grovel and agree when they came after him. They never could imagine a scenario, despite their training, that he would have anything to say back because they had never once experienced it. So when he does come back and he is correct, they're silenced. And that's the text. So what do we do with all of this? I think if I were to summarize a message that God's speaking to you today with this text, I'd say this. Jesus loves you, this I know. And I would remind you that in all of these scenarios, that Jesus wins and Jesus shows his love for you. And so, if the bulletin's not printed correctly, Jesus still loves you and still serves you. If you go to another church in Advent and the candles are purple instead of blue, Jesus still loves you and Jesus still serves you. If you think some unchristian things about the family that walks in late or sits in your seat, Jesus forgives you, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus serves you. If the songs get mixed up, and Easter isn't quite Easter, and, or Christmas isn't quite Christmas, Jesus still loves you, and Jesus still serves you. And the sum total of all of God's law and all of God's word to us and all the traditions, beautiful traditions that we use to remember it and teach it all boils down to what's important to God is not simply his law. What's even more important to God is you. And Jesus knew that he was about to make the ultimate sacrifice for all of these people that lived in fear of God their whole lives and remind them that he loves them. Now, i got to ask, Jesus knew there would be Pharisees there. Jesus knew that he was gaining enemies. Jesus could have gone to places that there would be less chance of running into enemies and running into Pharisees. So why does he go to this place? Why does he entertain this attack? Why does he bring up the anxiety of the disciples who are attacked in the process? Because when the scribes lose and the text ends, Every person there told every person they knew who told every person they knew. And all of a sudden, everyone everywhere knew that God loved them. Maybe for the first time in their life. And that the Savior promised was the Savior who had come. And that the totality of their relationship with God was not one meant to keep them away, but one to draw them close. And so they learned then, like we learn today, that the great message of God to you is that Jesus loves you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life eternal. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite forward uh, any of our new member candidates that are here uh, at this service and their uh, family elders uh, as a show of support. And uh, bring your bulletins. 
Oh, you got a, it's just you, all right. I knew we had a pile at the early service. <laughs> yeah, you can do it though. All right. Yeah, you can just stand and face me. All right. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you on this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in God, the Father, and in the Holy Spirit. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism to be faithful and true? I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and in God's church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do, by the grace of God. Do you desire to become a member of this congregation? Will you support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts that God has given you? I will with the help of God. Upon this, your confession of faith, I acknowledge publicly that you are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Will congregation please stand for prayer? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both with the heart to believe and the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that by your word and spirit they may continue steadfast in the one true faith in the fellowship of this congregation as together we await the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's welcome the newest members of our family again with a round of applause. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shorn forth in our lives graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and all those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that your own wills may be, our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands, we commend our service members, Renee, Scott, Dan, Kevin, Rachel, Abby, Thomas, Jim, Tim, Jonathan, 
Paul, Chandler, Stephen, Randall, Braden, Chris, Sean, Stephen, Evan, Leith, Paul, Nathan. We also pray for those that are in need of healing. Dave, John, Allie, Carl, Caroline, Rosemary, Mike, Oscar, Herman family, Stephanie, Christina, Ron, Ned, Ethan, Tony, Russell, Sue, Heather, Jimmy, Haywood, Buddy, Ellen, George, Linda, Carol, Carrie, Simon, Carol, Mark, Nancy, Linda, Brianna, Megan, Judy, Avis, Daryl, Jane, Lisa, Mark, Ernie, Anna, Ina, Vinny, Steve, Ralph. And we also pray for the family and friends of Tony, Rosella, Steve, and Eric. And all those who are in need, praying for them at all time, that will be done, Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you know there are enemies all around who seek for opportunities to do harm. As our nation reflects on the turmoil in Afghanistan and the actions that grip us in fear, grant us confidence to know that you will never forsake us. Comfort those who fear and those who mourn and use the full strength of your kingdom to bring to them and others the good news of peace and pardon that is ours in Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs, Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, 
that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love with which he manifested to us when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we're bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. 